part of my title and we will talk about what goes on visually and the visual aspect of watching TV or watching a video. He's also engaging his ears usually because normally when we watch TV we watch with the sound on and we're paying attention. So if he's watching uh, a football game then he'll be watching the players, watching the action on the screen, but he'll also be listening to the announcer describe the action and talk about what's going on. So that's pretty obvious. Audio, visual, watching TV and listening to the TV. But there's a third thing that's going on. This guy is also engaging his brain. And I don't so much mean what he's thinking about exactly. Uh, when we do something like watch TV, our brain helps us with that work. The brain has this incredible ability to focus. It filters out sounds that might be going on roundabout, uh, and it prioritizes the information that comes in. It helps us select uh, certain things to focus on. And maybe this guy who's watching TV, maybe his children are in the next room and they're saying, Daddy, Daddy, please come play with us. But his brain is focusing him so much on the TV that he's watching that he doesn't even hear that. That's an automatic response of the brain. The fourth thing, which is the, the fourth part of the title of my talk, is the mind. He's using his mind. Again, if he's watching football, he might be thinking about his team's previous game and their performance. He might be thinking about um, the outcome of this game. He might be thinking, oh, his favorite player is doing a terrible job. So while he's watching and listening and while his brain is helping him do that, there are also some things going on in his mind. So those four things that make up watching TV, those are the four sections of my talk. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, what happens with watching, what happens with listening, what happens in the brain, and what happens in the mind when we watch video, authentic video or watching TV. So yeah, critical thinking, somebody mentioned there in the chat box, that's definitely going on. So I'd like to start with the ears, with the listening part that goes on. So for teachers, what does this have to do with teaching, with what we do in the language classroom? The first thing I'm going to suggest is that we should make use of all audio in the classroom and not just spoken word. When we talk about listening, we often assume that listening has to be a dialogue recorded to go with a course book, or it has to be a podcast or a radio program or something that has been prepared or maybe even something authentic that has words in it because we're English teachers, right? So we think people have to listen to spoken language. Well, I'll show you an example shortly of how we can use audio that doesn't have one single spoken word in it. And yet what we'll see is that it's full of language anyway. We can use audio to bring language into the classroom, even if it's not spoken words. The second idea, my second tip for listening with video in the classroom is that we control difficulty with audio task interplay. That means that we've got the audio over here, the thing that we listen to, but then our job as teachers is to decide what our learners do with the audio. What's the exercise in the classroom? An example, I could play um, a little bit of a Shakespeare play, for example, a recording of Shakespeare. You'd say, oh, that's really difficult. Or I could play uh, a newscast from the radio. And we'd say, oh, yeah, that's, that's tough. Listening to the news in a foreign language is really difficult or I could play the radio broadcast of a football game. And again, you'd say, oh, that's really tough. But if I played all three of those for a beginning level class, and the, the, what I ask my learners to do is to choose which one is a play, which one is the news, which one is a football game. We've got three words in English there, news, play, football game. And just based on the sound of a Shakespeare play, a football game, and the news, the learners would be able to choose which one was which. 
so we could take this very seemingly high level audio bring it into the classroom control the task and make learners able to do something with it the third thing is that we want to plan success oriented activities and this is especially true when we bring in maybe slightly difficult listening the simple way of putting success oriented activities is just that we want to give learners something they can do we need to control the level by giving learners a task that they can accomplish rather than saying okay here's a TED talk answer these difficult comprehension questions we don't only have to give them difficult comprehension questions as I just gave an example of we can say which one is the play which one is the football match which one is the news that's an example of a success oriented activity okay so what I'd like to do now is give you an example of the audio only from a TED talk, from a uh, from real life, some authentic audio. Actually, I don't want to. Uh, we'll get to TED talks later. I'm going to play a piece of audio, and I would like you to in the chat box just write what you hear. What's what do you think this is? What sounds can you hear? Maybe where is it taking place? What's going on? Um, so I will play this audio, and we hope that there will be no issues um, with lagging. Let me know if you can hear it, and then tell me in the chat box what you hear. Okay, so we're getting all kinds of words in there, jazz music, music, live music, trumpet, we're getting various musical instruments. Did anyone hear any of those words spoken? No, but you're producing the words that you know, so I've brought language into this classroom simply by using sounds. And so you can imagine that if we gave this task to low-level learners, even kids, it would bring some language into the classroom. So that's what I mean by using listening that doesn't necessarily have language in it. What I'd like to do now is show you the video that goes with this. This is actually part of a TED talk. So this is our first, our first attempt at uh, playing a video. Emily, does that need to be dragged over into there we go. So this is the picture, this is the actual video that that sound comes from. Okay, that video worked for me. I hope it worked for everyone else. That is from a TED Talk called Tom Thumb, The Orchestra in My Mouth. This guy's job is called beatboxing, and that's what he does for a living. When he gives his TED Talk, he explains his job. He talks about how he, um, his mother always used to tell him, why are you making all that noise? You know, why don't you get a job? And he gives a TED Talk and says, look, Mom, I've got a job now. This is my job. I get paid to do this. The amazing thing is that all of those sounds that you heard, he recorded on stage during his TED Talk. So he made a recording of boom, 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 starts with the bass, then he adds the drums, and he does the whole performance. So we can see that by focusing first, by leading with just the audio, we can bring a lot of language into the classroom. We could get students talking about musical instruments and so on. And then if you had this talk with a group of businessmen, you could go on to talk about their jobs because Tom Thumb talks about his job in the video. If you were working with a group of younger learners, you could talk about how we make sounds, musical instruments, and so on. So it opens up this, this whole world that could work at any different level, but including beginner level. So that's an example of a TED Talk that you could bring in at a very low level. So that's 
ears, engaging the ears. Um, if we wanted to break this down a little bit, an authentic listening skill we could teach would be listening for nonverbal information. So encouraging our learners to listen for things, not just words, but what other information can you gather when you listen? Here's some examples of language or grammar we could bring in. Uh, at A2 level, concert, playing, song, stage. It's a trumpet, it's a concert. There's an audience, there are people playing music. We could look at modals of conjecture if you wanted to raise the level a little bit. It could be, it might be. Continuous forms, they're clapping, he's playing. Oops. So what we can see here is all of this language comes into a lesson even though we haven't listened to any words. So audio is powerful like that and using video just for the audio works really well. Okay, so the three tips for engaging the ears are we make use of all audio, not just voices. Our job as a teacher is to control the difficulty with the interplay between the audio and the task and we want to give learners listening tasks that they can succeed at. And it doesn't mean just listening comprehension or listening for grammar, something like that. Okay, what I'd like to do now, uh, you might guess where we're going. We just looked at using the audio portion of a video. Now we'll look at what we can do with just looking at the visuals. So I've got some more tips for focusing or engaging visually. When we choose video, and particularly when we choose TED Talks for the classroom, we want to choose visually rich video. Visually rich means that there's a lot to look at. It's not just a person standing on a stage. When I was developing uh, the books that I've written using TED Talks for National Geographic Learning, one of the jobs was to choose TED Talks. And so I got to watch a lot of TED Talks. And especially for lower levels, you start to notice some of them have more visually interesting things to look at. Sometimes it's just Bill Gates sitting on a sofa. So you have Bill Gates and you have a sofa and it's not so visually interesting. But other ones give us pictures in the background or people who are wearing amazing clothes or people who are interesting to talk about in other ways. We'll look at that shortly with an example. Another thing that I've come to feel very strongly about uh, is that we need to encourage students to tolerate incomplete comprehension. When I started my teaching uh, and especially started using video 20, 25 years ago in the classroom, I felt that learners should be able to understand 80 or 90 percent of what they listen to. We should go for looking at the script very closely, they need to master the grammar, they need to master the vocabulary. But we live in different times now. Even lower level learners are going online and looking at things like TED Talks or playing interactive games and they don't understand everything that's going on but they continue to engage. As a language learner, uh, I've been in situations uh, where I was learning a language in a country that I lived in. For example, I lived in Japan for a couple of years. I was studying Japanese there. And I frequently did not know what was going on when my friends were speaking in Japanese. But I wanted to continue to have a social interaction. I wanted to continue to improve my Japanese. And so I just had to find ways to try to continue to join the conversation. Um, and I had to be content not understanding everything. I think we can give our learners a little bit of that, a taste of that in the classroom by giving them something possibly challenging to listen to and we say, look, let's focus on this, let's focus on this. You don't need to understand everything. And that is better preparation for the real world. If they go on to study in English or work in an English speaking environment, they won't understand everything, but they'll develop some skills for continuing to engage in social interactions, even though their comprehension is not complete. The third reason for using video is learner engagement. It's interesting to look at. 
people share cat videos on Facebook because they're fun to look at. They make us laugh. They give us something to think about. So pictures are powerful because they make a connection. We, we, we feel drawn in. We watch TV for entertainment and relaxation. So we can use that uh, powerful resource in the classroom. OK. So what I'd like to do now is look at the second video. And the second video, it has no sound. So don't worry that you can't hear it because there's no sound. Uh, I would like you to simply watch the video and think about what you can see, what kind of person are we looking at, and also I'd like you to think about what she's probably talking about. So uh, as you watch, you can type in the chat box who you see, what you see, any vocabulary items that come to mind, anything like that, and also the topic that you think she's talking about. So here we go. And I'm going to let this buffer a little bit, uh, Emily, so we'll see if that helps. I'll start the video in just a second. We're hoping to get a, a smooth video here. OK, here we go. Okay, Emily, let's, we'll stop the video there. So I see some of you are asking for sound. The, the point of that exercise was to watch with no sound and just see the language that we can get just from the pictures. So in the first part, we brought all kinds of language into the classroom without the spoken word, but just with music. It triggered a lot of vocabulary and grammar that we could talk about. In this case, I can see lots of ideas coming up in the chat box about what this is about. So we see a person, we see a small person, a wheelchair, a handicapped person. She's probably talking about motivation. She could be talking about her life story. Lots of ideas there. And that is because it's visually engaging. We look at her and we think, wow, that's, you know, she looks very different. We don't often meet someone like this. And yet she's giving a TED talk. So why is she giving a TED Talk? What's she talking about? She must be talking about her life. She must have something to say. She's just a person on, on a stage, and yet we see all this language being generated right here in this chat box on my computer just by looking at a picture of her, and I think that's powerful. So we can use a video like this. Now we've talked about some ideas, what she might be talking about, who she is, what she looks like. We've talked about some vocabulary that might be connected with her. Now what we can do is um, look at the same video, but this time we'll have the sound. And we can, now that we're prepared to listen a little bit, we're focused on her, then we can concentrate on, on listening this time. It's a very small country town. So I'll give this again just a little minute to load. And this time it will be the same part of a TED Talk, but with the sound. So you can hear a little bit about Stella Young's story. I'll start in three seconds. OK, here we go. A very small country town in Victoria. Uh, I had a very normal, low-key kind of upbringing. Uh, you know, I went to school, I hung out with my friends, I fought with my younger sisters. It's all very normal. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a Community Achievement Award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice, but there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they were right, you know. I went to school, I got good marks, 
I had a very low-key after-school job in my mum's hairdressing salon, and I spent a lot of time watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Dawson's Creek. Yeah, I know, what a contradiction. Okay. All right, so we can pull that video off now, please, Emily. So that's Stella Young. Um, if we brought that into the classroom, uh, we could look at what we just did, which is using visual information to anticipate or to support listening. So we watch first, we develop some ideas, and then we listen. That makes it easier for students. If you could hear what she was talking about, it was very normal stuff. She talked about where she was born, where she grew up. She said her life was normal. She fought with her sisters. She also used some B1 level vocabulary. She used to hang out. She fought, as I said, with her sisters. She said she hadn't achieved anything. Uh, the disabled, wheelchair, that's vocabulary there. She talks about uh, her life using the past simple, and then she also uses the present perfect. We often grammatically teach contrasting the past uh, simple and the present perfect. So she gives us a very natural example of that. We could also use this in a, a self-introduction, just telling your story. So she gives a beautiful example of saying, this is where I was born, this is where I grew up, this was my childhood. And we can imagine using this for younger learners, for business people who are uh, working on their self-introduction to make business small talk. Even though she's an extraordinary person whose lesson is something more about um, inspiration and so on, we can use some of the language in her talk in a very everyday way. So those are just some ideas that we could pull from Stella Young's TED Talk. I encourage you to watch the entire talk. It's very funny um, and a good one to use in the classroom. Okay. <clears throat> So the tips for engaging the eyes, we want to use visually rich video to prepare for listening. We give learners something interesting to look at that can bring language into the classroom even though they're not listening yet. It's a great way to, to find out what language they already know and we can also maybe pre-teach some language based on the visuals. We also want to encourage students to tolerate incomplete comprehension. You won't understand every word of the talk but you can understand some of the main ideas and that's good enough, that's useful. And then we use videos like this because they're entertaining, they engage learners. All right. So with Tom Thumb, we talked about engaging the ears. We focused on, in that example, using music to bring language into the classroom. With Stella Young, we just talked about engaging the eyes uh, and bringing language into the classroom based on what we can see without listening third part of the talk is about engaging the brain. Now, this uh, is, I'm going to give you a, just a very brief explanation of something called cognitive load theory. Uh, this is work that was done by an educational psychologist called Sweller in the late 1980s. And this is a description of what happens when we watch TV. So the audio and the visual mode of information, there are two modes of information, audio, what we can hear, and video that we can see. Those two channels of information, the picture and the sound, go into what Sweller called our sensory memory. This is very short-term memory that allows us to get from the beginning of a sentence to the end of a sentence. So we can you know, start to put ideas together. What our brain does is pays attention to certain things and selects certain things that we will focus on, and that brings the information into the working memory. So if this guy's watching the football game, he's watching his favorite player, he's watching his favorite team, uh, and his, his brain is starting to think about these ideas. Where learning takes place is when something goes from working memory up into the long-term memory. So if he's watching this football game and there's a, an amazing goal, uh, something wonderful happens, then the next day he goes to the office and talks with his friends and says, ah, oh, did you see that amazing goal? He's learned that. 
And the reason we know that he's learned the information that came in is that he's able to retrieve it. So learning basically just means you put something in your memory so that you can bring it back out again. Sweller was not doing research in language acquisition. This is not about language acquisition, but I think we can see a connection to the work that we all do. What we're trying to do is help our learners hear language, hear information, and keep it in their brain so they can produce it again. So what's powerful about video is, uh, yeah, sorry, I should have that on a slide. I'm going to type its cognitive load theory. I've just put that in the chat box, cognitive load theory. Good question. So the, um, what Sweller observed about long-term memory is that in theory, it's unlimited. There's no, strictly speaking, there's no limit to how much you can hold in your brain. I've found that actually my long-term memory is limited and I forget stuff, but in principle, it's limitless how much you can learn. But what is limited is working memory. This is the memory that we have to use to get things up into the long-term memory. So the working memory, when we talk about cognitive load, cognitive means thinking, load means work. Cognitive load theory is concerned with trying to maximize the efficiency of the working memory when we're watching video. That's what Sweller was studying, educational video. So Sweller wanted to discover what he could do to create videos that were the most useful for teaching purposes, not, not just language teaching. He was interested in corporate training videos and so on. He wanted to get, um, he wanted to get as much information across as possible, uh, without wasting any effort. Question, sensory memory, uh, is sensory memory limited? Somewhat, and that is because you can only pay attention to so many things at one time. So if you're watching the TV, you won't hear the birds singing outside or the traffic noises or all the other distractions. So stepping aside, one thing, um, some, some observations that Sweller made are some things that we know about video. Video engages the brain because it's processed much faster than written text. So we say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a moving picture, a video, is worth, what, 10,000 words? We can see a huge amount of information transferred directly to our brain just by watching a moving picture. It's full of information. And even if you don't listen, even if there's no speaking, it's full of information. We saw that with Stella Young and with Tom Thumb, loads of information in those two videos. And by information, I just mean ideas, things we can talk about, things we can think about. What we also know is that video is cognitively less demanding than reading. That means it's easier to take in information, watching it and listening to it, than it is reading. Reading is harder work than watching video. Reading has a place. I'm a big fan of reading, but video can be a very efficient way to transfer information. The third thing about video is different research, not swellers, about uh, brain cells that we have called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are cells in our brain that activate emotions based on what we see going on around us. So if I look out my window and I see a small child running down the street and the child falls and hits his head and hurts his head, I will probably go, ah, oh, oh, I bet that hurt. And I will feel some kind of emotional response even when I see something bad or good happen to another person. This is why we go to the movies. We go to the movies because we see pictures, we hear stories, and we feel something. We feel afraid in a horror film, or we feel sweet feelings when we see a romance, or we feel um, strong emotions of fear or something like that when we see a thriller. 
So there's an emotional connection, and we can bring some of that into the classroom. And it doesn't just have to be James Bond films. Something like a TED Talk can also trigger a response in your brain that engages you. It's physiological. It's, it's, a, it's chemicals released in the brain and um, these mirror neurons activating emotions. So what Sweller recommended is that we control cognitive load. We need to, in other words, make sure that we're giving the brain a good amount of information but not too much because if we give too much information then it becomes confusing it's it, if there's too much information coming too quickly then people can't understand so what we want to do is what sweller calls use matching modality now the modes modality is the the audio mode the sound and the video mode the pictures we want those two things to match as much as possible. I'll show you an example shortly, but another example might be if we have a video of um, me waving, going, hello, and then the audio says, the man is saying hello, then you can understand perfectly the modality is matching. The sound says he's saying hello, and the video is the man saying hello. Matching modality. If you show a picture of me and you say, Lewis Lansford writes English language teaching textbooks, well, that's true. And if you know me and you know that about me, then those two things go together. It's a picture of me and it's something about my job. But if you're a beginning level learner and you don't know, you don't understand the words that you've heard, seeing a picture of me, it doesn't help you want a picture of a, a textbook or something like that. So in other words, the words and the pictures need to match. Let's, let's, we'll, we'll look at an example of that very shortly. The opposite of that is that we want to avoid video with a lot of interference. We want something that very clearly shows one thing. So if, uh, if, the, if, the, if, if it's a picture of me, then we want to say, this is Lewis Lansford, and we want only Lewis Lansford, not five other people. Because if we say this is a picture of Lewis Lansford and there are five people there, it might be interference. It might be confusing to know which person is being spoken about or named. Finally, we want to um, present video, present input in manageable segments. So at lower levels, maybe four minutes maximum, four, five, six minutes. Because if you show an entire 20 minute TED talk, especially at lower levels, listeners become tired. Okay, this is a TED Talk by Elora Hardy. It's, uh, she's an architect and uh, designs houses like this. I'll show part of her TED Talk. I recommend that you watch the entire talk, but we'll watch, watch the talk and think about it in terms of matching modality. How do the pictures and the words that she says go together? I'll start the video in just a second. So just notice in this talk how the words that she speaks and the pictures that we see match and support one another. When I was nine years old, my mom asked me what I would want my house to look like. And I drew this fairy mushroom. And then she actually built it. I don't think I realized this was so unusual at the time, and maybe I still haven't, because I'm still designing houses. This is a six-story bespoke home on the island of Bali. It's built almost entirely from bamboo. The living room overlooks the valley from the fourth floor. You enter the house by a bridge. It can get hot in the tropics, so we make big curving roofs to catch the breezes. But some rooms have tall windows to keep the air conditioning in and the bugs out. This room we left open. We made an air-conditioned, tented bed. And one client wanted a TV room in the corner of her living room. Boxing off an area with tall walls just didn't feel right. So instead, we made this giant woven pod. Now, 
We do have all the necessary luxuries, like bathrooms. This one is a basket in the corner of the living room, and I got to tell you, some people actually、um, hesitate to use it. We have not quite figured out our acoustic insulation, <laughs> so there are lots of things that we're still working on. But one thing I have learned is that bamboo will treat you well if you use it right. Okay, so what we saw there is a.、Uh, In some ways, we could say a fairly technical talk. She's an architecture. She's talking about building design, but each time she names part of the house, we see a picture of it. So she talks about the the giant tented bed, the woven pod, some words you would know, bedroom, bathroom. She talks about, but some words that you don't know, you can understand because she's saying it as we see a picture of it. So that's what Sweller is talking about when he talks about matching modality. And that is powerful for education. Some things that we could talk about,、uh, or that we could do in the classroom with this,、uh, as an authentic listening skill, we could talk about dealing with new vocabulary. So, if you're watching video and you hear a word that you don't understand, in this case, you could certainly try to figure it out based on the pictures you can see. Some language that we might look at, some vocabulary. She talks about.、Uh, Mushroom, the shape of the house she designed, living room, bridge, roof, wall, window,、uh, at B1 level, floor, valley, air conditioning, bug, basket, luxury, B2 level, pod, bamboo, ferry, tropics, story, as in the story of a building, curve. Again, she's telling her life story, and she again uses the past simple and the present perfect, as、um, Stella Young did. We could talk about describing houses or homes or places. Often, when we publishers or we writers want to write a unit on introducing the house, we worry about what kind of house do you show, because the the kind of house I live in is different from the kind of houses you live in, and someone over there might live in a flat or an apartment, and someone over there might live in a brick house, and someone might have a wooden house. But here we've got a bamboo house, and it's a beautiful house, but it's not like anyone's house. So we can all Um, we don't have to worry about what kind of house we're presenting because it's this amazing, we could say almost dream house. We could also use this,、uh, as you say, somebody is saying with teenagers, with young learners. We could also use it with architects and designers. We could use it with engineers, talking about the the, the strength of various building materials and so on. So there's a huge flexibility using something like this in all kinds of different classrooms. We as teachers bring the content to match our students' needs. Okay, so following Sweller's cognitive load theory,、um, we want to use choose videos, use video with matching modality. So the pictures and the sound make the eyes and the ears work together. We want to avoid video with a lot of interference, so we can just see very clearly what we're talking about, and we present input in manageable segments. Okay. Ears, eyes, brain, mind. We talked about the ears with Tom Thumb, the、uh, eyes with Stella Young. We've just talked about engaging the brain and looked at the the TED talk from Elora Hardy. The final section that I would like to talk about, the final thing, is engaging the mind. So when we engage the mind, we're talking about what someone mentioned earlier: critical thinking.、Uh, it's it's not so much how the processes of the brain work, but what we think about. So we want to engage learners with、uh, and motivate them with humor, with unexpected things, with interesting visuals. We want to stimulate critical thinking by maybe beginning to、um, discuss messages, what what the message of a speaker is or the message of a talk. And we could also start to use、um, scripts or subtitles to help learners with the language. Um, so I'll show this. Let's see. Yeah, we'll look at this TED talk、uh, and just think about what's going on visually. This is uh, we'll uh, what's going on visually and how how it engages us visually. And actually, Emily, could we bring this quiz in after we watch this? Oh no, well that's all right. We can do it now. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about whether subtitles are useful when we show uh, a TED talk, especially subtitles in English. And people have different views about that. Maybe it helps learners uh, understand better, but other people feel that we should be focusing on listening and not on reading when we watch a video. So uh, you can take a vote now on whether you think it's learners uh, good for learners to watch videos with subtitles. OK. So this is a TED Talk by uh, Matt Mills and Tama Rukertz. It's called Image Recognition That Triggers Augmented Reality. And uh, it's an explanation of a product or an app that these people have created that does something kind of amazing. So focus on the, the visual side of it and also on the idea of the product that they've introduced, which is actually quite tricky to explain. But let's take a look at the video. So let me start with this. What we have here is a painting of the great poet Robbie Burns, and it's just a normal image. But if we now switch inputs over to the phone, uh, running our technology, you can see effectively what Tamara is seeing on the screen. And when she points at this image, something magical happens. <laughs> now, summer blinks on flowery now what's great about this is the there's no trickery like here there's no um there's nothing done to this image and what's great about this is the the technology is actually allowing the phone to start to see and understand much like how the human brain does not only that but as i move the object around it's going to track it and overlay that content seamlessly. OK. So what that talk gives us, again, thinking back to the very beginning, bringing something in for very low level learners, even if you don't understand any of the spoken word in that talk, we've got something very interesting to look at, something that you want to know more about, you want to find out about. So that will engage learners and make them interested in it, even, even at a lower level. But if we wanted to bring this in at a higher level, for example, B2 level, uh, intermediate, upper intermediate, then we could also start to really work on the difficulties of listening to fast speech, for example. It was fairly clear what I just played, but Matt Mills gets very excited later in his talk. I'll play you a clip of it. Uh, and in fact, he starts to speak so quickly that the first time I listened to it, I had to listen a couple of times to understand what he was saying. He was so excited and speaking so quickly. In terms of language, there's some good uh, technical language that we might deal with here in, in uh, the, the topic area of digital technology, device, plug-in router, cable, image, content. We could also start to look at elision and the way spoken English works. At the beginning, he says, let me start with this. But what he actually says is, let me start with this. And at higher levels, we need to start working on listening to that sort of thing. Another thing we could do is start to look at the, the analyze the grammar that he uses. Throughout his talk, he uses sentences like this. What we have here is this amazing technology. Lots of cleft sentences. What this does, and if we think about that type of language, it's actually more the grammar that a salesperson would use than the grammar that an engineer would use. An engineer would tend to say, the camera is held up this way using the passive voice. So he's, he's making it all sound very exciting because it's his product and we could say he's trying to sell it. So at intermediate level, we can start looking at the connection between grammar and message. We could also um, <clears throat> use this to talk about describing a product. With teen learners, they could describe their favorite device. This is my phone. These are the apps it has. If we're working with engineers, they could describe a product that they've worked on. If we're working with business people, they could describe a product that they're going to sell. So again, because of the visual interest, because it's just fascinating to look at, we could use it with all kinds of different learners and then tailor our lesson to focus on what our particular learners need.
the question about subtitles, I didn't actually see the result of um, the poll, but I'm frequently asked what my personal opinion is about subtitles. And I think it's better as I've been, everything I've been saying um, <clears throat> so far, that we want to focus on what we can hear and what we can see, and maybe reading should be a separate thing. However, I think once you get up to higher level, uh, having learners watch something like this with the subtitles on can be very useful. So Emily, if we could show this bit of the talk with the subtitles, I think you can see how it could be useful because he's speaking so quickly. Uh, it could be useful for learners to watch something like this over and over again so that they can match the spoken word. Sorry, yeah, they can match what they hear with how it's written down because they're very different. He speaks very quickly. <laughs> so it's not magic. It's a very... I'll play it in just a second. <laughs> so it's not magic. It's available for everyone to do. And actually, I'm going to show you how easy it is to do by doing one right now. So a sort of, um, I'm told it's called a stadium wave. So we're going to start from this side of the room on the counter three and go over to here. Tamara, are you recording? OK, so are you all ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> Fellows are really good, huh? <laughs> OK, in particular, that line at the end, he says, fellows are really good at that. I didn't know what he said the first or second time I heard that. Fellows are the people who are the guests in the audience at a TED Talk, people who attend a talk. And so he's just saying, oh, you did that really well. But he's sort of talking to the audience. He's talking to Tamara, his partner. It's all over the place, and it's very quick. So in a situation like that, we could help learners sharpen their listening by using the subtitles. But maybe not the entire TED Talk with subtitles in the classroom. Now, uh, Emily, just to give you a heads up, there was one more TED Talk. Um, the David Senge one, but I think what I'd like to do, because we finish at 2 o'clock, I'm going to skip through that, uh, talk briefly about keynote and perspectives, uh, and then that'll give us a, a little bit less than 10 minutes for some questions and answers, because I, I've seen a lot of questions pop up in the chat box, and I haven't paused to answer them, but I'd be happy to, to discuss some things. So I'm going to, uh, actually, let's look at this, summing up the uh, mind, we want to engage learners' minds, motivate with humor, unexpected visuals like that picture that he just showed of the augmented reality. We can stimulate critical thinking by discussing his message. We could actually get learners to think about why he's explaining this product. Is it because it's going to help the world or is he trying to sell it? Both of those things are okay. but maybe we could critically think about the language that he uses and what it says about his messages. And then, as I just showed, we could use scripts possibly to help, uh, help learners with the language and engage with the listening. OK, so that's it. Um, we talked about engaging the eyes. Sorry, first we talked about engaging the ears with Tom Thumb and how we can bring audio material into the classroom that's full of language and stimulate language in the classroom without actually listening to any spoken words. Similarly, with Stella Young, I talked about bringing visually rich material into the classroom with video that gives learners tons of language to talk about even before we do any listening, and it can help us with the listening. With Sweller's cognitive load theory, I talked about engaging the brain by making sure that when we do have audio and video, that the two modes of information work closely together. And then we just talked about maybe at higher levels, engaging learners' minds by doing some critical thinking and giving them things to think about. I just wanted to mention, sorry, this is one I, I want to skip over. I've haven't managed my time perfectly. A number of these TED Talks are used in the Perspective series. This is a, an upper secondary course that was published uh, within the last year. I'm very happy to say that we have been shortlisted for a, a prestigious award from the English Speaking Union. Their message is to help 
people find their voice. Uh, and we, we feel strongly that Perspectives, which uses TED Talks, helps cultivate an open mind, uh, helps gives learners a, a clear voice, and helps develop critical thinking, a lot of the things that I've been talking about. Keynote uh, is a series I wrote, published a couple of years ago. That's for young adults and adults. It also features TED Talks. A lot of these talks came from the Keynote series, so if you want to know more there, please have a look at Keynote. Uh, we actually won two years ago in 2016 an English Speaking Union Award, again a prestigious award, and then we also won a British Council Elton's Award. So um, it's been amazing to see that people who really know what they're talking about think the materials we're putting together are brilliant for learners and brilliant for teachers. So if, 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 you, if these are appropriate for your contexts and you like the idea of teaching with TED Talk, and you want to know more, please check out uh, Keynote and Perspectives. Finally, I'm on Twitter. If you want to hook up on social media, I'm also on LinkedIn. I haven't put it here, but I have a professional page on Facebook. It's Lewis Lansford ELT. Uh, I have a website if you want to know more about my work. And also, uh, I can make available a free worksheet that is designed for helping you get started using TED Talks in your classrooms. It's available at this link, which I think um, Emily is probably going to paste into the chat box. I am working with uh, TEFL Equity Academy. You may have heard of, they do some online training. So I, as a National Geographic author and uh, TEFL Equity Academy have got together. We're going in the next year to produce some online training that's quite a bit like this, actually. It will be a more in-depth look at te teaching with TED Talks, an entire course on teaching with TED Talks. So if you're interested in these ideas, follow this link. It will ask you for an email address. You can express interest, and you'll get uh, an eight-page PDF that includes a worksheet you can photocopy and use in your classrooms straight away. It's a really low prep thing that I hope you'll find useful. I think that leaves us with about four minutes for any questions. So if you have any questions you want to type into the chat box, I'll be happy to try to address them. Well, thank you all so much for the positive feedback. So I'm getting lots of thank yous there. And from all over the world, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up. 237 people, wow. No, no other questions I could catch throughout the webinar. Um, just wanted to you know, thank you again, Lewis, for this. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. We're so happy you could make time to be part of this webinar experience. Uh, we will have another session. Oh, here's just the link again to the worksheet from Lewis. You can actually click the link directly in there um, on the screen. All right, I'm glad, Karen, you enjoyed the webinar, and I hope everyone else found it useful for your teaching practice and now have some new things you can try out in class. Uh, just a few things to mention before we wrap up here. Um, there will be a survey at the end of the session that you'll all be directed to. We'd love to hear your feedback so we can help to um, bring more exciting and engaging webinars that are useful to you as teachers of English. Um, so we'd love to hear your feedback there. Uh, also, at the end of the webinar, there is a link to download the free demo code for the Learn English with TED Talks um, learning app. So definitely do check that out. It is a great way to bring the big ideas from TED Talks into your classroom um, to help your learners understand and discuss those powerful ideas. So please definitely do check that out. Um, and we will have several more webinars this in the next couple months. So you can see the full schedule on our site right here as well as follow our InFocus blog, which is eltngl.com slash InFocus. Love you to be a part of that. And then also join us on our social media community as well on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. 
So thanks everyone for joining. You will be receiving the certificate of attendance in about five business days from the webinar that will be sent along to anyone who attended here in an um, email that does have a link to it. So just be ready to look out for that. And we hope you can join us again soon. Thank you, Lewis.